we had a few beers and um, we were actually on our way home and we walked past a, a bar and it had a neon light flashing saying like dwarf throw it inside or something like that so it was like red it was like a red rag to a, a bunch of bulls um, after a couple of beers but again with hindsight what were we doing drinking the two, second week into a World Cup do you know what I mean it was just stupid really Hello and welcome to the Rugby Pass Off Play podcast with Ryan Wilson and Max Lee. Later on the show, we'll be joined by England and Lions legend and the third highest premiership scorer of all time in Mark Cueto. Before we get into that, wow, how are we both holidayed up? Talk us through it. Who's starting? Max, Vegas, what? Viva last week. Oh, it was, it was big, gentlemen. Just got back yesterday. I'm... Um... I'm half a man. I'm a soulless husk. I'm a vessel, just on autopilot. Uh, yeah, it was glorious. You know what it's like. Matt, it's come closer. Show me that pink eye. <laughs> <laughs> Straight from the rippers, old beat. No, this is actually, I'd just been walking the dogs. And the yeah. people hit me like a ton of bricks. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's sounds... get back. The missus is like, what's really what yeah. wrong with your eye? What's wrong with your eye? I was, I was examining some orifices at a very intimate range. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't. <laughs> my God. Oh, oh, my pink eye. Holy Matt, I, hecka, that pink I eye. cannot. What's that scene? I cannot of? believe. What movie is that from? Oh, that's shit. how you get pink eye. <laughs> you know, when oh. he's looking at him, he's in there. <laughs> uh, knocked up. Is it knocked up? Yeah. yeah it knocked oh. up. They're chatting, chatting the old pink eye. But yeah, it was good. It was really fun. Um, I, can't, I can't believe I forgot that you were in Vegas and we were coming on here. Yes, like, all I do, hold on, Mark, I'll explain to you. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the Caribbean and my phone's ringing and ringing and ringing. It's the middle of the night and I'm like, for the first time, I'm in bed before like 12 o'clock. So I'm like, I'm, I'm not answering that. It's my mate that's in Vegas, that, <laughs> the stag do I was meant to be on. And then ding, ding. Ding, I'm just getting pictures from my mates. I'm like, who is this? Looking at it, there they are, all with Max in Vegas on their first night. <laughs> oh, it was so good. That was probably my favorite club as well, Omnia. Oh, wow. What a place. Because you get like, you're in the terrace, so you get, you get like a, a sort of view of the strip with all the neons. It's nutty. It's a hell of a place. Yeah, it's crazy. We were staying at the Cosmopolitan and the casino floors are real. My God. Stephen Lutu was doing quite well. Who else did well? Harry Thackle and the slots did very well. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was good fun. Who knew the slots were a lucrative option? I thought it was just roulette and crabs all day, maybe some blackjack. But yeah, very good, sir. It was, no, it was, people love the old one arm bandits, don't they? <laughs> yeah, one arm bandits. <laughs> what they coming from? Um, yeah, did my mates chew your ear off for about an hour as well? They have no, no idea about rugby, haven't got a clue, but they just knew you from the podcast. And yeah, so, so I was. I was queuing up next to one of them at Wagamama, but I didn't know that this time. And then we bumped into them again at Omnia, and that's when they knew, because one of them was like the guy who watches rugby, watches the podcast. And then it was, oh, mate, yeah, which one was it? Uh, yeah, but you weren't here, which was sad. Oh, no, but it was safe. That was a safe, safe option. Choosing yeah, the I British think... Virgin Islands over a stag in Vegas, like by the sounds of it, they have kicked the utter ass out of it as well. Oh, and shit. so have you by the looks of your pink eye. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, mate, oh, was it amazing? Honestly, though, how long were you there good. for? It was very good. Three days, yeah. It was big. It was, it was, it was hard, though. Three like, days is enough, yeah? Yeah, three days is more than enough. I got back yesterday and I was... Dust, absolutely dust. Yeah, they were um, five days, and I was like, "Boys, is that not a bit? Is that not a bit over the top?" Oh, that would cripple the wallet as well. Five days, especially if you're just sending it every day. Oh, mate, unbelievable! Which pool party who, did you hit? Yes, yeah, so, and who uh, else did Mar you go with? Mar also, Marky and Tao. They were both very good. They were good. I, I wanted. I, I still. I think Wet Public's my favourite though so far but Marky was was hilarious it was very funny and who um, were you there with Max? Uh, DT it was D, it was Daniel Thomas's stag um, who else was there? Ed Holmes Harry Thacker Sam Bedlow Stephen Luatua uh, 
But there was a good, uh, there was a strong Welsh retinue from his, uh, from Carmarthen as well. Those guys, can oh. it. the Welsh farmers, oh. different, played it, played oh, it, uh, yuck. some of the greats, so absolutely different level. The Faroe Welshmen, yeah, they were class, class form. But yeah, it was, it was, it was very good, mate. Yeah, very big. Henry Purdy or Jake Heenan, yeah. Were there any themes? Were there like, did he get handcuffed to anyone by any chance? Oh no, he had to wear. He had to have like a. What did we have? He had to wear like a pink thong for like a real tiny pink thong for the pool party, and then he had like a dog lead and a collar and stuff. It was all good crack. Yeah, but you sort of yeah. met up with Joe Mack as well. I did. I did. That was mate. So that was crucial because went to Soho, got apps, and then Joe wanted to send it. You know what he's like. So he sent it. Then I had to get on the plane the next day, like hanging like Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. But that set me up real nicely because I was like adapted to the alcohol by that point. My liver had just hypertrophied into an alcohol processing machine. And then I was good for the three day, an absolute three test match warrior. It was all good. Wait, so Max, you went into Vegas having got absolutely smashed the day before going yeah, to you know Vegas. When, you know when you go to Soho and you haven't seen a mate for ages, you know it's just going to get weird. Yeah. Like Soho just is that, that kind of vibe. It's like the oasis in London of seedy revelry. So such was the way I had to get weird and send it in. So that was a yeah four day with a nice sleep in between. But I slept the whole flight because of that hangover. So it was, I woke up, I was in Vegas. It was delicious. Great, great timing. I'll be honest, my trip turned into a bit of a stag do as well, to be fair. Like, I'm just dad, <laughs> you mental over there in the BVIs. It's just people with loads of money that just sit and drink all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I couldn't believe it. I could not get over how much I had to drink. I had to. Um, I've got the, the serious fear now, but boys... The speech went all right. I think it went all right. Only two people out of 140 got, got up and left halfway through. So, <laughs> uh, what was it like? How long did you uh, talk for? Uh, half an hour. The speech for half an hour. A little bit oh, half fair. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's big. Long. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, I didn't think it was going to be that long. And I think it was good feedback when someone went, No, I, I said, Oh, it wasn't too long, was it? And he went, No, 15 minutes is perfect. And I was like, shit, is that all I was up there for? And then someone was like, no, no, he was up there for half an hour. So I think that means it went quicker than they thought. But I got some good feedback, good feedback. But yeah, one, um, one person did say, yeah, there was only a couple of people got up and left. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh, shit. Um, but yeah, so I did a little bit of obviously research on the island and uh, found out that it was named by Christopher Columbus, who went there in 1493. And he named it after St. Ursula and her 11,000 virgins. And then that obviously led quite nicely into a lot of virgin jokes. <laughs> Which, uh, like what? Uh, uh, I can't say most of them. Um, one of them was uh, the man gets back from, from the pub and he says, Honey, um, how many men have you slept with? And she turns around and says, oh, God, I don't know, babe, 30 to 40. And, uh, he looks at her, so, oh, 30 to 40. She says, yeah, 30 to 40, roughly. So oh, I wish, you know, I wish I'd married you when you were a virgin. She looked back at him and says, I wasn't a virgin when I married you, babe. <laughs> get it? Max doesn't get it. Uh. <laughs> she obviously slept with 30 to 40 men after they were married. <laughs> but it's easier when you tell loads of people because like, 60% of them will get it and then everyone laughs and then tell <laughs> that is infectious yeah but there was um yeah and then obviously a little bit about when you start version into google what comes up and <laughs> set, the, set the stall out early but nah it was good i enjoyed it and again another brilliant night i ended up um being dropped home by a brilliant man called andrew emery who is a barrister out there a barrister for people on an island where tax is a no-go obviously and we got back at about half four in the morning and I said pulled up to the hotel and I'm like how do I get in and there's a gate it's closed and and he went to drive off so oh Emery come back and he pulls up next to it <laughs> climb on his bonnet climb onto his roof <laughs> without telling him and basically just ran over his car and jumped over the fence uh, I got chased by security back to my room so that was the end <laughs> that was the end of my night <laughs> 
Walked straight in the door at half four in the morning. Frank wakes up. That's us awake from five o'clock onwards. So never really went oh. back to sleep. So, um, yeah, 24 hour travel back door to door. It was, um, I was pretty rough yesterday. But no, it was a lovely trip. BVI rugby, baby, all the way. Love them. So we had, we had one remaining final to enjoy over the weekend in the top 14, the top 14, where an electric start from Montpellier helped them to a 29-10 win over Castres at the Stade de France in Paris. A first top-tier domestic title for them. Boys, uh, three tries in the first 12 minutes. Most exciting start to a final ever, surely. Yeah. What about that? Just slots it through. Couldn't have come off any better. Any he better. He was yes. on absolute fire. But yeah, they put Cast away in the first 12 minutes and there was no coming back, was there? It was big. Yeah, that was it. That was game done. The atmosphere afterwards looked amazing. My oh. gosh. You see it put, I uh, saw Zaki's um, montage afterwards. It just looked completely bonkers, man. Yeah, good on him though. That's a mate. That one achievement. Well, I think he got mad at the match as well, didn't he? Well, the other one was a try saving tackle. He basically comes yeah. back and as they're scoring a try, he just gets the hand on the has a try saving tackle. Was involved in the other try that they scored and pretty much with a little shoulder ball. Yeah, he was on fire. He was around everything. So what an achievement, man, for him. And it's like he's still bloody young, isn't he? Is he still yeah, young? Still young. Still young. Yeah. That's mental, isn't it? So uh, fair play to him. But you're right, the celebrations on Instagram are just envious, aren't you? Watching that. You see, you see the, the trophy down at the beach and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, see it, you see it everywhere, don't you? you yeah, who was good. it last time? Um, you saw trying to surf on it. Was it Entomac? <laughs> trying, to, like, <laughs> trying to skimboard it when he was down the beach as the waves were coming up. <laughs> oh, last, yeah, last time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone like Zach Mercer now, right? He's, he's just done that. Everyone's watching it. He's going to be getting offered probably so much more from the other you know, clubs, the classic thing where other clubs then try and come in and, and take everything. But he's not going to be able to play for England if he stays in France. So what do you do? Cash or country? Cash. I, don't know. I reckon you sign, you sign, you sign a one-year, the year before a World Cup, and then just... Hit that, get that England opportunity, and then straight back to Top Cat's odds for the big bucks. <laughs> I reckon that's. Like, do, you, do you think he, he gen? So you, that is still definitely the rules of England. You cannot play for outside England. They do it for a few. Well, like, look at the. I don't. I don't think you're going to get um, Big Ed Joe breaking his rule for for Zach. Even with the, like he's never been like that. Never has. I don't think he ever will. Mm. That's what happened with Steph when he got like European Player of the Year. Remember, everyone was calling for Steph to be included, being the except, being the exemption to the rule, but it never happened. I don't think it'll be any different with Zach. And Steph won the thing like twice, three times. Yeah. You, you got to weigh it up, haven't you? <clears throat> up yeah. If he's desperate to play, play for England, then yeah, you you'd think he'd be looking into that. But then again, it's a big old risk because you imagine you come back to England and then Get so and, have, and it's it's a different league, very different style of rugby like yeah. he's not a heavyweight back row is he so it probably suits him although you'd say that down in I suppose top 14 you'd expect you need to be heavyweight to play down there but he just shows it for all those smaller back rows out there that anyone can do it anyone can do it as long as you're yeah but he's outrageously skillful for a, for a, yeah that's what kind of gets him away from it so that elusive footwork and mad bag of tricks um you're right, though. It'll be interesting to see what he picks. Um, but yeah, I yeah, reckon... We could, we could try and do the maths. We could try and work out England games, six nations, five games, 25 grand. 25 grand. Bear in mind, he's on like 40-odd 40, 40 now, I think, a month. What him? Big, big, big Euros. I don't know. I'm just. This is just what I hear through the grapevine. Yeah, and I imagine yeah. it'll, only, it'll only go up now, won't it? Now that he's like done that. But he's got time on his side. So that's why I think he has the luxury of being able to pick a season back in the Prem to play for England, do the World Cup, and then come back for some, yeah. another big ass payday. So, in our hypothetical seeing as uh, the two teams who played in the, in the Challenge Cup final have gone on to win their domestic leagues this year. They've played against each other next week. Who would win, Ryan? Leicester or Montpellier? Bloody hell. Bloody hell. I reckon Leicester. I don't know why. I just think it's, 
it's bloody hard. I don't watch enough of uh, Montpellier, to be fair. Um, I'd probably back Leicester for some reason. Uh, God knows why. But yeah, I don't know. I just think the way they've played all season, I've obviously followed them a little bit more on the way they've gone. So I'll give it to Leicester. Max, what do you reckon? Yeah, I'm sort of, I'm with you on that. I just think the way Leicester plays, sort of, it, it would, I think it would go well against Montpellier. Like very flinty defence up front. Montpellier play a lot. Um, I just think that sort of suffocating kick chase and Mad D just is lower. Unless Montpellier were on absolute fire and attack, um, I just feel like that style of play that um, Leicester bring is so hard to beat, especially when you've got the players they've got in the positions. Just George Ford keeping it behind you, Freddie Stewart fielding anything you're putting back, bringing it back with interest. It's tough, man. Then you've got like Wigglesworth putting them up perfectly every time with the box kicking game and that big ass pack. Um, yeah, I think it'd be tough for any team at the moment. They play a lot more that, structured, wouldn't they? Yeah, exactly. They just play a lot more structured. It's just, I think it's, it's a difficult team to break down once they get in their flow. They get ahead of you as well. Very hard to get back into the game, I think. Yeah. So, based on this season's predictions, actually, obviously, Montpellier would win that. So, cause yeah, guys. exactly. <laughs> the based star power this. comes through. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, obviously, an incredibly entertaining season in both the Prem and the URC, as well as the Top Cattles, with a lot of standout individual performances throughout. But seeing as, as you boys play in two of those respective leagues... Let's start with Max, your Prem Rugby Pass team of the season. Basically, as Lou said, we're going to go with Ellis Kenge, the captain of the Tigers' home undefeated record and premiership champions. I think his uh, leadership at this point brought a lot to the uh, lot to Leicester's sort of revolution. Um, and then honourable mentions to Joe Marler, Mr. Quinns himself, ever consistent 80 minute efforts all round. At hooker, <clears throat> I'm going to go with Sam Matavesi, Northampton hate. Uh, Northampton Saints he's been part of everything that's good with them honourable mentions to McGuigan unbelievable haul of tries for, for Newcastle Falcons then at three we're going to go with the blue-eyed giant William Collier of Harlequins um, an absolute set piece linchpin for them that scrum has been dominant all season um, and he's had a, a formidable showing all, all year then at four and five I'll go with I'm going to take Elliot Stuke at four. Because um, he's your mate. Also, yeah, one of the greatest blokes. But he's had a hell of a season. Been, been player's player for Wasps. Um, pretty much the cockroach that team until, until, until this season. Couldn't, couldn't be injured. An unbelievable player. He does it all. Um, then at five, I'm going to have John Luke Dupree, the Aryan juggernaut, can play all over the back row, but he's been featured at lock regularly for sale. And he is just, he's been outrageous for the last, for as long as he's been in the Prem, to be honest. Then six and seven, I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to go with Geordie Reed, the uh, Gloucester triple threat. Seven, I'm going to take, um, I've got to take Ben Earl, don't I? He's had an unbelievable season um, for Saracens, uh, uh, Gallagher Premiership player of the season. Yeah, he's the man. And then at eight, I'm going to take uh, Tom Willis, most defenders beaten. Uh, doesn't get mentioned as much as his brother or Alfie Barber, but he's been an absolute stalwart for Watson in the back row. I think he's a really, really good player. Um, nine, we're going to go with uh, Mitchell, the the Chepetto of the Saints back line. Absolute puppet master. So good. So good. Then at 10, I'm going to take George Ford, um, the architect of everything great about Leicester's um, Kicking game. Uh, 11, we've got to take Max Malin's unbelievable try haul this year. Been oh. everywhere, can play all over the bat line as well. 12 and 13, I'm going to take Andre Estehes and the terrifying giant from Harlequins. 13, we're going to take Fraser Dingwall. He's been unbelievable for the Saints. Then at 14, um, I'm going to take Caden Murley. Uh, again, another guy. I don't think he gets enough credit for Harlequins when we are being mentioned that back three. I think, I think he's been the most consistent and done everything wow. that asked of him and more. Absolute X factor all over the park. And then at <clears throat> 15, I'm going to take Tyron Green. He's got the most meters in the Prem. He's an absolute savage. He can do it all. Fields a high ball well. Uh, 
honourable mention is obviously to Freddie Stewart. That is my premiership team of the season. I tried to keep it with some variety, get, get, get as many teams as, in, as involved as I could. But that, that, I think that's an honest representation of the, um, the good and that's uh, in the prem. Over to you, Ryan. Over to you. You you want me to just go for it? Yeah, that was a, that was excellent. I mean, yeah, we want to. It's a tough one to follow up on. Uh, it is Ryan, a tough one. Who makes your URC Rugby Pass team of the season? So, Oxenshire. Yeah, he's the man. From Sharks, been unbelievable. And the other side of the scrum is Thomas Detroit. He's yeah. also at the Sharks. They best scrum in the league, been ridiculous. But right in the middle of those two, Grobler. Yes. He's been outstanding. The Bulls. Bulls, Bulls that good try yeah, in, the, in the final, I think it was. Second row, don't mean any offence by this. The Not big yet. second row at Bulls. Naughty. He's naughty. He's, <laughs> he's, a, he's from Wigan and he's naughty. He's naughty. <laughs> but I'm Wigan. telling you, this fella gets through some absolute graft. The big beard on the man. Next to him, my old mate, Richie Gray. I'm, listen... I know we didn't finish it right up there, but he's done 80 minutes every week. Most line-out steals in the league, some, something stupid like 16 line-out steals in the league. A little mention to James Ryan, who's been outstanding for Leinster, but they're my second rows. Oh, the back row was hard, boys. The back row was hard, but I've gone for Nick Timoney from Ulster. He's been outstanding, not only his carrying, but most tackles in the league. Um, so he's definitely in there. Now, Jack Dempsey at Glasgow, for me, most metres made by any forward. He's up there. I think he's in the top four for players in the URC yeah, yeah, who the metres made. So Jack Dempsey's in there. He's and then it's man. between Kutsia and Roost. But Kutsia's got the most offloads and, again, been incredible. And the big fella, Roost, and he's obviously back in the, in the South African squad and he's bumping people like Dwayne Vermeulen in the final. So do you know what? Because he's my mate, Dempsey won't mind. So... Nick, Timoney, Ruse and Kutsia are my back rowers there. Nine and ten, Gibson Park and Ross Byrne. Ross Byrne, I know Sexton's there, but he's been pivotal for the length of this season and got them to where they were. I know they didn't quite make it, but those two on the nine and ten axis. Eleven, Sinatla from the Stormers. My God, the man's quick and he's been outstanding. Little yeah. nod to Darcy Graham, though. Again, a brilliant season yeah, from the man. little man. Yeah. Little man. Um, but no, Sinatla takes that. Willem Surf for Stormers. Again, this guy has been unbelievable for the Stormers. James Hume at Ulster at 13. Yeah. Um, yeah. 14 was hard, boys. It was hard. I want to say one of the boys at Glasgow, Ken Silare, the Argentinian, before he got injured, he was outstanding. You got Zass and you got Matt Hansen. So to mix it up, I'm going to put Matt Hansen in there at 14. Because yeah. again, I love him. I bloody <laughs> love Matt Hansen. Very an Irishman, yeah. Yeah, I like him a lot. And then at 15, holy hecka, you've got some options here. Again, Ulster, Stormers and Bulls. Mike Lowry, Jalant or Arance for the Bulls. Most clean breaks, 23. So I'm going to take Arance from Bulls. And I don't even know if that's how you say his name, but he got 23 clean breaks throughout the season. So he's in there. So there you have it. I've actually done my homework and I've picked the team. You're welcome. So coming up, it's an absolute uh, feast of fine international rugby to enjoy. Uh, there are five massive matches just on Saturday alone. Let's take a look at the respective test series, uh, get some predictions from the boys. England, Australia. England coming off the back of questionable Six Nations, huge defeat to the Barbars. Australia have lost their last three matches, although they did do the double over the Springboks last year. Um, thoughts, thoughts, thoughts? So I think it's going to get ugly, gentlemen. Because what we're failing to re uh, remember is that this Australia team has some very juicy Mavericks in it that weren't playing in those last few tests. We've got Karevi in the mixer. Probably the, what, like, just because he's playing in Japan, you're not hearing about him, but probably the best centre playing the game right now. I'd say definitely up in the conversation. And then, of course, we've got the social media sensation, the superstar. That is Quaid Cooper at 10. And anything can happen with that guy. He's got a very deep magic hat with lots and lots of tricks. So it should be... Um... And anyway, the last time we saw him play, he was actually playing a very sort of test match oriented game. Wasn't the, wasn't the, the, the jinky, steppy, out-the-back wristies of um, the Queensland Reds days. But um, we'll see, man. I, I, just think, I just think Australia are going to have the bit between their teeth. England looking ripe. They're going to smell blood in the water. Um, 
And, is he um, Priesty, the other centre? Like, oh, yeah, outstanding. Yeah, exactly. Carving up all season. Carving. And then Marika Koroi Betty, the scariest so the game right now. Mate, Runs like he's trying to kill one. grass. But yeah, it should be interesting. It should be very interesting. But I, I, I believe Australia have, have, have got this one. And then there's, of course, Tanya Latupo, um, Tongan Norse mythology incarnate. So God bless. Um, let's see yes. if Eric can swing low enough. But what do you reckon? So, what do you reckon? 3 0 to Oz? Yeah, I think so. Oh, geez. all right, 2 1, 2 1, 2 1. No, 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 that's fine. No, because they, you're going to take away what I want to say. <clears throat> I want to say 2 1. But I, I reckon it's yeah. going to, I reckon it's go 1 and 1. I reckon we'll go, we'll see one, the one. Aussies win. Then I reckon England will scrape the second one and then think the Aussies will win the third. I'm just trying to think what's England's in here. Because England, what's England's in in this game right now? Like, how are they going to beat them? Because right now, um, mm. of, based on the last few games, they usually overpower them. But I just think um, it's not that it's not the same sort of pack yet. No. But maybe and Aussie, the Aussies, it's all about front football, and they've got enough in there to get front football. Enough, with yeah, they've got enough flinty blokes in there now to get it done. I think, but um, maybe I'll be wrong. But it's yeah, I think bloody interesting. Isn't it? All of these tests are going to be crazy. But I, yeah, I'm with you. I reckon the Aussies will win the win the tour. Um, in total, but how exciting. I'll tell you, more importantly, I'd love to put some bets on this, which I'm not allowed to do, obviously. So anyone out there, I don't know whether you can or not, Owen Farrell to get a yellow or red card throughout the three tests. That would be easy money. That would be easy step? money. <laughs> Wouldn't you've, just, you've just... Adult. Yeah, fair. Um, from that stat, I told you he's never been carded for a high tackle in an international game. <laughs> uh, but people are aware of it now. I reckon this is it. So, the, so imagine the odds will be brilliant. The odds will be brilliant if that's never happened before. It's coming. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for it. Who did he? Who did he? He absolutely no armed a lot for Australia, didn't he? Uh, Rodder. That's because time. you know what the Aussies are like as well, and the crowd will be like on them. They ha- like they hate each other, don't they? You know what I mean? Nick, 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 Nick bloody White palms just, are over him. Hey, let's give him a bit of shit. Yeah, Nick White just flying into everyone. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine the sledging that'll be going on from the Aussies and they'll be getting stuck into him and he'll lose he'll lose it a little bit and I can see it. I can see it. Oh, it's going to be a good old tour, that one. I'm excited yeah, for that. That's a good one, yeah. Another big heavyweight clash sees Ireland heading to New Zealand for three tests. Irish, obviously, brilliant Six Nations. Great win over the All Blacks oh, last this- year. Um, although they did, the, the midweek team did just get slightly pumped by the New Zealand Maoris, at least lost relatively um, easily, let's say. Uh, and they've never won a series over in New Zealand. Kiwis, though, COVID, you know, what, what, what do we think? Five games, though. What, what were Ireland thinking? They won five bloody games. Are they mental over in New Zealand? They're going to be absolutely smashed to bits by the end of this. As if we've not played enough rugby. Jesus. Five. Oh. I don't. I, this is a hard one. I think this is the toughest one to predict. I think it is. It is because Ireland have won 2016 in Chicago, 2018 in Dublin, 2021 in Dublin, but have never won over in New Zealand. Yeah. Also, I think like that. New, the, you know, this new kind of generation of New Zealand players now. You can sort of are coming through, and I think they've got a bit more time in the saddle. Um. And I think what we saw in the championship won't be a fair reflection of what they what uh, Ireland are going to face, and there's going to be revenge on their minds, isn't there? So, yes, revenge. Um, I don't know. I'm going to go. What do you say? It's five tests. Five tests, but we'll we'll not not that they're not as good of games, but we'll rule out the Maori All Blacks. There's two Maori All Blacks games, so there, there's a couple midweekers almost. So the three main tests. I'm going 3 0 New Zealand. 3 0. Oh, gosh. I know. I know. I said it. Yes, I did, people. I kind of. I know. I just think going over to New Zealand is fuck. It's just completely different. It isn't Chicago. It isn't Dublin. It's a different old kettle of fish, my old friend. Uh, But there's me saying that. Fuck me. The Irish have been unbelievable. Yeah, they've been unreal. Are there any Irish Indians? Listen, I will get a little bit of. You know, shit for this. But I just, I sort of feel it in my gut, Max. I think it's going to be 3 0 New Zealand. I'm sorry, uh, any Irish people. But the, Irish, the Irish squad, though, is fit? Like, is everyone fit? What are the injuries like? 
No, they're fit. They're fit. They're, they're, they're fully strength. Let's just right, say go two one. I'm going to go 2-1. Two? 2-1 two? Two to Ireland. Oh, bloody I'm hell, Max. I'm, I'm, I'm backing them. I'm backing them. I'm going to say France was a blip. Although Leinster in the final was basically Ireland. Oh, I don't know. Maybe they're waning. Maybe they're waning. Maybe their form is waning, and now we'll find out truly. Oh, my God. How good is that? Yeah. It's a, it's a good summer tour. It's a good summer tour. Here we go. Next up. Another heavyweight clash. World champions, Springboks hosting a Wales side who've spent the last few years probably now somewhat in transition. Thoughts oh on this God. one? This is, yeah, come on. What are we saying here, right? <laughs> Oh no, you just want me to put it out there and then I'll get absolutely slammed yeah, off. I want you to get hated on, not me. I already <laughs> slammed the England lads. And they're going to hate me for that. <laughs> um, Mate, right. well, hold on, what was, what was Wales' last game? Tell me, where was Wales' last game, Max? You know what? <laughs> Max, it was in the Six Nations. Ange Kapamutso. What oh, did he do to him? It was the case. They lost, they lost to Italy. And now they're going over to South Africa and they are playing in Pretoria, first game, Bloemfontein second, and then Cape Town. <laughs> the two altitude ones first. Oh, mate. Listen, I love them. There's a lot of my mates in that Welsh team. I love them. But, boys, <sighs> take your tin helmets with you. It's going to be a long, <laughs> long old day. It's going to be a long <laughs> old tour. Back your shoulder blades because you're going to need them where you're going. Hope the AC joints are tight, lads. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so we're saying that's a three nil. Okay, well, just, just just on that one, boys. You know, oh, like let's go is. through. You got you got in the squad. Okay, forwards: Adam yeah. Wynne Jones, Fadatau, Lydia Navidi, Adam Beard. In the backs, you've got uh, bigger. Um, bring back George North, Josh Adams, Reece Samet, Cuthbert, Liam Williams. Like all, like these are all guys who have historically been. Very, very good. You guys like yeah, they're gonna even, get pumped. Know, even but... historically, even if you put that team out, like say Wales on their best day, best form, they will they potentially might beat them. But we're talking about this world champions here. They probably should have grand slam their tour. England sort of got a bit lucky on a, on a few occasions in that contest. So I just think yeah, I just think South Africa rugby right now is piping hot and it is bubbling. Um yeah, and then Wales are on a quest to rediscover form. But as you said, they've got a lot of guys returning back, which will help them so much. But I still think, even if a couple of those games are competitive, I still think um, the Springboks are going to get a 3-0 um, a win. Tough old shift going to South Africa, Mark. It is. Thank you, thank you. Well, you, agree, you both agree on that one. Fair enough. Finally, Brian, your boys heading to Argentina for their summer test <coughs> uh, They'll be up against... Checks as Pumas, if you will. What are we thinking? It's going to be another interesting one. They played Chile. The A team played Chile last week and won. That'll have no bearing on the game. There's a lot of young guys getting their first caps, but uh, I, I reckon we'll be all right. I reckon we'll be all right going over there. Like We're missing, obviously, some key players, like Hoggy and Finn, Russell. Um, they didn't go over. Um not sure the story behind that. I think it's probably just more of a building block towards the World Cup and to get a few more leaders in the team. But I think we'll be all right. I think, listen, the Argentinian team are going to be dangerous and under Checker, they're going to be a different type of team. Could the RG sneak one of them? Maybe, but I think we'll be all right. I reckon 3-0, possibly 2-1 to Scotland. Max? 2-1, I'm 2-1. 2-1 to Scotland. Well, we are now delighted, delighted to be joined by England Lions legend and someone who knows a thing or two about scoring in the Prem as well. It is Mark Cueto. Hello. Can you, can you see me or can you hear me? Yes, you can see me now. Yes. Mark, you know, well. it's only been three years since everyone started doing Zoom calls, mate. <laughs> mate, honestly, what a nightmare. <laughs> Uh, um, so first things first how are things Mark? Things are good things are good it's funny mate it's funny depending on <coughs> generally life's good I think um, <coughs> my 
sort of honest opinion when when they get asked about I'm I'm seven years retired now it's it's crazy um and obviously you, you get asked a lot about do you miss the game and and everything else and, and I say 100% I miss the game every every minute of every day I think any you stand me next to any ex-pro not just rugby any any professional sportsman if or woman if if they tell you that they don't miss it they're absolutely lying. I can guarantee you that 100 percent because nothing, nothing can compete to, you know, essentially playing, playing sport for a living. You know, it doesn't it doesn't get better. But it's 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 not only the fact that you, you're playing a game that you love and you're training every day to, to allow you to do that and to get better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but it's, it's it's more the people that you're involved with, the the level of. You know, essentially, I compare. You know, the the worst person in a Premiership rugby team, or you know, an international team, the the worst compared to the best is is so it's so minor. You know, even even the worst player in that team is in the top one percent of 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 rugby players in in the country or in the world. So, the level of of people that you're working with and you're training with and you're spending time with, you know, whether it's in a hotel room or or on a training field or in the gym or whatever, the, the level of people that you're working with are so, so elite and so driven and everyone's got the same attitude and everyone's working towards the same goal that you you sort of take it for granted because you've never known anything different. And then you, know, you, you, you come out of that environment and, you know, I'm in, in an office now, I'm lucky enough to have, have I've sort of got some great opportunities in front of me, and bizarrely, I'm a I'm a shareholder in a in a in a, in a fiber broadband business, which is you know if you'd asked me that seven years ago, I'd have, I'd have probably laughed at you. But the, probably one of the hardest things that I find in this environment is, you know, you you see in your management, your CEOs, your FDs, those types of people are very similar to. The people that I mentioned a minute ago that you, that I'm used to, you guys are used to working with in <clears throat> in an elite sport environment. But you also have the other, the very other end of the spectrum, and there's, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you've got other people that then it's not that they're, they're, they've got no ability, but they they just got completely different priorities and, and outlooks on day to day life. And sometimes whether they've got one job or ten jobs. They make it last nine to five, and they don't really have the drive and the attitude and the, you know, the desire to get stuff done as quickly as maybe some of us do. And and it, it's it's a it's a it's a big adjustment to to make, if I'm being honest. Do you wish you'd stay in the game a bit longer in terms of one? What like after you stand that, I'm I'm going to kick love like you the after show. I'm going to play till I'm 42 years old, without a doubt. Well, yeah, I think everyone everyone says. How, how do you know when it's time to retire? And you know because you, you, your brain stays as sharp as it. If anything, your brain gets better because with it, with experience and time in the game and everything else, you 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 can learn how to take not shortcuts, but you know, for me as a, as a as a winger or whatever, you know, maybe you lose a yard of pace, so you learn how to take an angle on a player rather than relying on your pace. So like Chris much. Ashton, but, like floating around the wrong side of the pitch. And he just still seems to have. I, I spoke to him the other day, and I'm like, and again, and, and you guys will, will get there when when you get to the last year or two, you you start to convince yourself that there's a million and one things in the game that you hate. You know, I don't I don't want to be told what to do in the gym. I don't want to be told what to eat in the dining room. I don't want to be. You know, I'm 35 years old. I'm married. I'm with kids. I know what the fuck I'm doing. Type of thing. But then when you come out of it, I I crave that email on a Sunday night of being told where, where to be and what to wear and what to say and fucking what to eat. I'm like hey, a lost... Spend I'm five like minutes with my missus, you'd, you'd be right. <laughs> Institutionalised. So, yeah, so I think you do... Going back to the question, I, I signed a four-year contract at 30 years old, which is pretty unheard of, really, particularly in, in, in my position as a, as a back three. And I always saw that that fourth year would be my last year... And as it happened that fourth year, I felt great, played loads of rugby. I think I played every game in the Premiership, scored tries, was, was playing well. And 
everything was telling me, I've got to stay for one more year. I've got to do one more year. So I signed for one more year as an extension. And I don't know what happened. And I didn't do anything differently. It's not like I went out on the piss and went to Vegas and ripped it up in the off-season. But over that six-week off-season, I came back for pre-season. It's like someone ripped the fucking spine out of my back. My, my legs went... <laughs> My legs went, my lungs went, every, everything. So then that last season was a real, real struggle. And that's when I say, I, I just knew, I just knew, like, there was times where in my head, I'm like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Your body just can't do it anymore. So, you know, you go from, you go from playing a game on a Saturday and feeling sore for a couple of days to that, that last season for me, I was waking up the following Saturday and I was still fucked from the week before. And I'm like, I'm not I'm going to play a game, mate. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Mate, I know exactly what you mean. I fucking feel like it now. <laughs> yeah, you know, mate, you know, you do know. But, but again, I'd say a lot, of, a lot of the lads, there's still quite a lot of lads that, that I played with, even though it's, it's a long time and stuff. And everyone falls into that sort of trap, as it were, at the, the back end of your career. You're sick of it and everything else. But I'm like, and I, and I had it when I was playing and it goes in one ear and out the other. You've always got some old bastard that's been retired like I am now saying, mate, play as long as you can play. Even if, you know, even if you're taking a bit of a hit, you know, we all want to play every week and it's a hit on the ego if you have to sort of step back because there's a young kid coming through and you sit on the bench a couple of times or even if you have to take a little cut in your salary because, you know, again, you know, if, if you're not earning 150 grand, then you think you're on a shit wage. But you come out, come out of that environment and... You know, I've, I've got sales. I've got sales lads downstairs working here. They're on, they're on twenty grand a year, and they're working the nuts off every day. They might, you know, they get bonuses and they get little um, little bits of added cash here and there. But the, you know, the money, the money in the game is, you know, you'll struggle to find it else elsewhere unless you unless you're pretty lucky. But apart from that, life's fucking good, boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh. no, I think. Uh, it's it's funny, mate. Like we all, <clears throat> when you're in it, you can't you can't see from the outside. But mate, just without sounding like that dickhead old retired player, mate, you just enjoy it. Honestly, it's the fucking yeah. time of your life, and you know you're playing with playing with some of the best lads. You'll be mates with the lads. You know, I I still I still speak to lads now. Obviously, you you have your I played at Sale for my whole career, so um, I didn't move around at all. But you, obviously, with England and everything else, I, I met a lot of different different lads. And I, you know, some lads. Paul Saki, mate. I never, I never played club rugby with him, and I probably only played maybe fifteen, twenty times for England with him. But I, I pick up the sax rang me two or three days ago, and it's you know I've probably not spoke to him for a year. I've probably not seen him for two or three years, but. It's, it's like he's one of your best mates and you've never, you know, you see him every day. And that's the, that's the sort of, you know, when you're, when you're sitting in, well, when you're standing in showers or you're sleeping in a bed next to each other or you're out on the training field or you're out on the field, you are. And it is, it is a bit of a fucking cliche and I'm not a massive cliche man, but, you know, you are putting your, your bollocks on the line for your teammates and that creates special relationships and, um, you know, those relationships... You keep until the day you die. So it's it's mega, it's mega, boys. So enjoy it, enjoy it whilst it lasts. Oh, yeah, Paul Saki, though, for example, was a bloke who wanted to retire. Like I remember I mean, saying how much he hated rugby. Oh mate, I'll never forget. As and it was before we both got caps for England, right? So you're going back, and it was one of the you know, the Saxons tour. I don't know if the Saxons tours still happen now, but they were the best tours you could ever go on. Yeah, <clears throat> you're not under massive pressure because you go to Canada and Japan and places like this, and you know you're going to win without sounding like a dickhead. And uh, one of the first tours I went on, and uh, we're all sat in a team meeting room, and the coaches are stood in front of us, and <clears throat> we're doing that classic, you know, you know, what what club are you at? What's your background? You know, trying to sort of, it's like a speed dating, isn't it? Trying to let everyone know who you are and what you do and what you like and what you dislike and what your hobbies and all that shit. And everyone's obviously playing the game and, you know, I'm Mark Cueto, I'm a Sail Sharks and my likes are, I love rugby and I love training and I love working hard and trying to get better. And, and my, dislike, 
my dislikes, my dislikes are lazy people and those that don't put, put the graft in and this, that, and the other. And everybody, everybody in the room is the same, as you can imagine, right? We're 20 years old and we're trying to impress. Gets to Sacks. Sack is like, my name's Paul Sacky. My, my dislikes are backing rugby. <laughs> um, and my likes are going out on the piss. And everybody <laughs> was just in hysterics. And this is in front of like the, the, the England coaches and everyone else. And it was just from that minute on, he was a legend of the game. Oh, and, uh, people like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let's, let's chat about, obviously, uh, you've had amazing experiences all around with Sale and, and, and with England. But let's start with, you know, the, obviously, the, the World Cup returns to France next year. You were a crucial part of the team uh, who took England to the final in 07. Can you run us through a little bit about how the performances turned around from, from kind of getting mauled by the, the Saffers in the group stage and then yeah. the players taking control away from Brian Ashton, yeah. those sort of things? <laughs> It was just a bizarre experience and <clears throat> probably the, the best experience of my, you know, rugby career, if, if I'm being honest. And it, and it sort of breaks me to almost put everyone, you know, you get into rugby and you, you want to play, you play for your club and then you want to play for your country and all that. And if you're lucky enough to do that, get an Alliance tour. And I was fortunate enough to play an Alliance tour in 05. And, um, 07 was just... It was just crazy, mate, from, I think, because of the highs and the lows and, and essentially getting to a World Cup final when, you know, looking back, there was absolutely no way on earth we should have got there. Just, just made it unbelievable. And, you know, we had a, we had a poor sort of build-up the 12 months prior. We, you know, we finished fourth or third or fourth in the Six Nations, which was, which was dire. We, um, I didn't go on tour pre-World Cup we sent a bit of a second team out to, to South Africa and then we conceded over 100 points in, in two tests in South Africa. So <clears throat> the whole preparation was was a, a disaster, really. But saying that, we, we had an unbelievable squad. We had four or five World Cup winners from 03. Guys like Jason Robinson, Josh Lucy, um, Gomez was there, Delalio, Vickery. <clears throat> so we had a, a massive wealth of experience. And then we had some sort of decent younger sort of blood talent, whatever you want to call it, um, with the likes of maybe myself, Saki, to, to name a, a couple, Matthew Tate. So we had, we had an exciting team, which was obviously led by Brian Ashton. And um, I think it was, for me, like, I, love, I love Ashley and I love everything about him, but it, it, was, it was probably that the crossover from <clears throat> Ash, Ash is very much... You know, if you compare, say, like a Clive Woodward, he was all about strategy. He was all about systems and calls and structure. Ashley was the complete other end of the spectrum in that he just wanted to put the best players with the natural talent on the field and let them play what was in front of them. <clears throat> but I think probably the back end of the 90s, the amateur era and the start of the sort of 2000s professional era, you could still get away with that. But, you know, certainly the way the game is now, you know, it was almost the start of where we've sort of got to with the game now. And there's, you know, a lot of structure, a lot of calls, a lot of systems that, that, that if you didn't have in place, you were always, you were always going to struggle. And, and essentially, I think that's why we did struggle um, throughout that sort of Six Nations, the tour. And the, and the start of the, of the World Cup, you know, we beat, we beat Australia. Uh, no, we beat... USA in the opening game of the World Cup, but we, you know, we scraped our way through. And then that second game against South Africa was, was an absolute spanking. And at that point, you know, the senior boys, the World Cup winners, that was when they sort of stepped in and, you know, didn't do it behind the coach's back or behind the Ashes back, included them, but, you know, just sort of said, you know, this, this is where, you know, we're probably not playing to our strengths. These are our strengths. We, you know, we need some more structure. We need some more calls. Put some sort of very basic things in, in place. And then suddenly we, we were lucky in, in a way that the following two games post that South Africa were take nothing away, but it was Samoa and Tonga, I think. You know, if, if you're facing, you know, even maybe one of the sort of the top tier teams, you know, uh, uh, whether it's the 
one of the big, th- well, we wouldn't because we've got South Africa, but even if it was one of the other sort of Northern Hemisphere teams, we, need, we needed to win both those games, essentially. And if we'd have, if we'd have had, you know, a, a Tier 1 team as well as a Tier 2, then it might have been different. But we had Tonga and Samoa, which we, we thrashed. We gained a lot of confidence. And then it, it's, it just went from there. And it was, you know, to... To think after that South Africa game, we we getting absolutely slated by the press. We get called Dad's Army. You know all the all the um, all the piss takes are, are being done in the in the press and, and everything else. Um, so then, I think six weeks later, we we running out for a World Cup final um, was was incredible, really. We sort of had room, rumors that uh, you know there was. Those who weren't selected for the 15 were, were out on the, on the beers quite, quite often midweek uh, the whole time. And, and Brian Ashton perhaps hadn't, didn't have quite as much control over, over that half of the squad. Is that, you know, was that sort of thing going on there during the World Cup? No, I don't, I don't no. From memory, I don't think it was. I think it, it's funny, isn't it? Because I was actually doing a, 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 speak, a, like a speaking gig with Lee Mears in Manchester uh, a couple of weeks back and it was to a, a big sort of corporate business and they were talking about leadership and you know success and bringing teams together etc cetera, etc cetera. and it, it, it's funny how you've got we've all got this perfect model in our heads of what success looks like and bizarrely you know if I compare the, so I did the 07 World Cup in France and the 2011 World Cup in New Zealand and if you compare the two squads and the two build-ups you know as I mentioned 07 we came third or fourth and we flopped in the Six Nations we toured South Africa conceded 100 points in two tests was a disaster compare that to 2011 we won the Six Nations for the first time in 10 years we we missed out on the Grand Slam ultimately yeah but we still we won the Six Nations so massive success Anybody would pick that that 2011 team, right? But you know, we we go to the World Cup. Yes, we had a great a great run in the in the pool stages. We didn't lose a game. We scored 20 tries, four only conceded one. But then we get we get beat in the quarter final. It's 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 funny. I mean, when you you know when you you reflect and when whether it's putting a team together now in sport or putting a team together in, in business or whatever. It is that you, you're doing, and, and 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 obviously there is a there is a perfect model, and and generally that model gets you success more often <laughs> than not. But it, it isn't it isn't always guaranteed, you know. I think it shows that see that like the little bit of adversity in 2007 that you had with Ashton and all the stuff surrounding it. It then gets the knockout foot. It's all it's one game at a time, and, exactly and right. I, I exactly. definitely don't believe that you lot weren't out on the piss midweek because I spoke this time for sure. And it, that yeah. well, <laughs> it's that long ago, mate. I can't remember. It. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, obviously, you, you over fifty caps for England, fifty-five caps for England. Uh, they they come up against Australia this weekend. Got nailed by the bar bars last week. Rather embarrassingly, yeah. a couple of miserable Six Nations campaigns. What, what do you make of sort of the current England setup and, and Eddie Jones since the 2019 World Cup final? I've got massive faith in Eddie. If I'm being honest, and I know it sounds crazy to say it, he's gone a bit mental, hasn't he, the last 18 months? But I think everyone's quick to forget the first two years when he when he came in, he took over from from Stuart Lancaster, and he and he went on a 20 game unbeaten run. You know, which which matched, I think, the All Blacks in terms of number of consecutive wins in, in international rugby. So I don't think there's any any doubt in of his his ability. His selections maybe is a bit, you know, a bit out there at the moment. But I'm I'm semi hoping that the fact that they're not playing well and they're struggling for form, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can almost be a blessing in disguise. And it's certainly will be keeping them sharp and it'll be keeping their feet on the ground and it'll be it'll be making them want to sort of work that little bit harder in, in, if that makes sense um, it'll be interesting to see how they, they go out in Australia This I think there's three tests I don't think there's any other midweek games or anything like that um, but I, I, again the, 
there's a, there's a lot of time. It's over twelve months to to fix things, and and sometimes you know we talk about the All Blacks. You know, I know they're a, they're a different animal now because they've they've won however many World Cups they've won and two back to back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for, for years they were the the classic, you know, peak in between World Cups and and failed during the World Cup. So you know. Hopefully that's that's what England are doing. You know they're they're struggling and they're stumbling around a, a little bit at the moment, but the next twelve months, you know they'll start to pick up some wins and pick up some momentum, ready ready to sort of hit the ground running. Ten players from that twenty sixteen tour when they went over there and they they three 0 Australia and absolutely hammered them. So he's got a little. Yeah. I can he's got a good spread of youth and older boys. He brought Benny Vullapola back in and Danny Kerr yeah. back in there, so he's got a bit of experience as well. I think I think the beauty of this squad, as as you said there, <clears throat> their their experienced players are still not that old. Yeah. Um, you know, Billy, I don't know what age he is, he's probably forty five, isn't he, in, in reality, but he'll tell you he's twenty seven. But guys like guys like um let me th- you know, Tom Curry, without being biased uh, biased to say, but he's he's twenty three, he's got nearly fifty caps. You know, he's, he's captained England. He's, he's been around for, for years. Maro Toje, he's, you know, he's still under 30. Um, you know, there's so many lads in that squad that are under 30, but, you know, um, I can't call him, um, like a, Owen Farrell, again, I know he's, he's, he's been injured and he's not had a huge amount of rugby, but hopefully in the next 12 months, you know, guys like, guys like this, they've, They've, they've got a huge amount of experience, but are still the right age, the right side of 30. Um, add to that some of the younger talent that, that, that's coming in, that, that are sharp and fresh and sometimes a bit naive, and that naivety can be a good thing. Um, you know, they've, they've got all the, the ability and talent that, that, that they need. It's just pulling it, pulling it together, and, and, and a big part of that is, is selection and... Um, It'll be interesting to see the way he goes with his, with his selection. Who would you start on the wing at the moment? You're going to ask me this because I'm so like out of touch with, with rugby at the minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that is Josh Lucy still playing? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd go with this kid called Quato Saki. And Robinson at fullback. Um, who would I play? Who would I play on the wings? I'm thinking yeah. Jack Noll and Tommy and John May, uh, Tom, Tom May, um, Johnny May, and those lads. Are they even in the squad at the moment? Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. On form and fully fit, but again, I, I don't know if those guys are. But they, Johnny May for me is has been unbelievable. I, re- I remember when he first got picked for England, and I was at Twickenham, and I watched. He's obviously an athlete, by and he's rapid which always helps. But I remember him catching a box kick on the left side of, of the pitch and he ran to the right side of the pitch and got tackled into touch on the right-hand side of the pitch without going forward. And I remember thinking, this is the sort of thing I see like my eight-year-old do at, at rugby on a Sunday morning. Like, how, how, is this kid, how is this happening at international level? But in terms of like improvement, He's, he's, he is like, for me, I know, and again, he's been injured and he's been out of the squad and stuff, but 12, go back 12 months, for me, he's, he's one of the best winners in the world. He's, the way he's improved and he's learned and his, his work rate, he's, you know, he's, he's, every aspect of his game has, has come on and add that to that raw pace and that raw ability, just, you know, again, just his, his try. I think he's in the top three or four for England in terms of, of number of tries in, in, in history now. So, you know, that speaks for itself. And then someone like a Jack Noel, I, I love, you know, he's a bit he's a bit more of a little, like, Jack Russell-y, Rottweiler, you know, gets a bit more involved in the rooks, throws himself about a little bit, you know, pops up here, there and everywhere. He's, he's a nice sort of counterbalance to to Johnny. And then... Um, it's, it's Freddie, is it Freddie Stewart, the Leicester boy, fullback? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just he's just been unbelievable. Um, you know, sort of ghost ghosts around a bit. Doesn't he almost doesn't look like he should be playing at that level, but just plays brilliantly. Never drops a high ball. I'm quite old school, and 
the basics are really important to me. And it's, it sounds funny to suggest that that you should be able to catch every high ball if you're playing for England, but he, he literally does. He cleans, he cleans everything up. He's got a bit of gas. He's got a bit of a bit of X factor. He create he can create something out of nothing. So those those three would sort of probably be my my first choice. Mark, quick one on um, 2011. Back in the England team out in New Zealand, another campaign yeah. with sort of hilarious incidents off the pitch, uh, forgetting your incredible hat trick against Romania, of course. Uh, what are your memories of dwarf tossing gate and Manu going for a swim? Probably just obviously the Manu thing was after we'd been knocked out, so it was almost it was stupid for him to do it. But I think mean, he was about eighteen. I can't believe I see I see Manu knocking around like sail, obviously at the minute and. I mean, again, I'm like, he must be, he must be 40. But I'm like, I think he's still only like 31, which made him about 10 when he played in that World Cup in 2011. But that was after the World Cup. It was after, well, no, the World Cup was still going on, but we'd been knocked out. It was a stupid thing to do, but it was blown out of proportion, obviously, by the English press, as they do with everything. The dwarf throwing was just stupid with hindsight. We, we... Without trying to justify it, we, we had a long turnaround between games. I think there was 10, game, 10 days between the first and the second game. So we went down to Queenstown, had a few days sort of doing some outdoor activities, all that shit. And then we had a few beers and um, we were actually on our way home and we walked past a, a bar and it had a neon light flashing saying like dwarf throwing inside or something like that. So it was like, red, it was like a red rag to a, a bunch of bulls. Um, after a couple of beers, but again, with hindsight, what were we doing drinking the two second week into a World Cup? Do you know what I mean? It was just stupid, really. Where and um, what did you throw them into? Was it like a dartboard or <laughs> <laughs> a paddling pool or something? Wasn't it? <laughs> a, a wall, a wall. I think it was just bizarre. Honestly, it was it was bizarre. But, but I'm trying to picture I mean, it. What was they like? It was it like a belt? A wall, and you just ram into a Velcro wall. <laughs> to Kishi's castle. I can't, I can't remember, mate. I can't. I don't. I didn't see any dwarfs, mate. I didn't see any. <laughs> Deep under the radar. I wasn't even there. I wasn't there actually. <laughs> so no, I think just just disappointing because we had we had a we had an opportunity to do well there, and you know if if you think we we only narrowly lost to to France, they went on. They I know New Zealand won it in the end, but. You know, for a long t- part of that final, they they look like they might nick they might nick it. So um, yeah, we let ourselves down, I think, essentially. But I, I don't think it was as I think we got I think we got shucked under the bus a little bit, and you know the press, and I, and I, I felt sorry, probably more more for Jono than than anybody else because he sort of had to step down, and I think. Not only because he stepped down with Stuart Lancaster coming and ruined my fucking England career to twat, but not not being bit bitter at all. I think if if John would have stayed involved for another four years, leading into that 2015 Home World Cup, it would it, have been a totally different it would have been a totally different um, outcome, and I and I, I massively believe that. I think you know everyone said he why why is he head coach of England he's, he's not done this he's not done that but he wasn't he wasn't there to coach he had an experienced coaching team around him he was there to to add value and from his experience the most successful English rugby player ever to play the game and we had a we had a really good in terms of like let's go back to that sort of template bullshit I was saying about you, you couldn't have had a better template it just needed that little bit of time and I think if if it had been given the time, regardless of, of, of me and whether I'd have been getting paid time, certainly wouldn't have played until the next World Cup. But I just think that England team would have been a far, far better place and better prepared to, um, to play that, that 15 World Cup. Toughest team you've ever played against in your career? Uh, New Zealand, definitely. In terms of international, yeah. I think the Aussies, the Aussies were always tough because they were like, you know, the couple of rabbit, rabbit out of the hat, you know, Gitto, people like, you know, Drew Mitchell, lads like this, can just create something out of nothing. But you knew if you dominated them physically, you would generally win the game. South Africa were just physical and direct. They couldn't, they didn't have that um, sort of create creativity behind the, the scrum. So again, you knew what was coming, but New Zealand just had everything. They had 
the physical, the physicality, the aggression, you know, and the ability to, you know, create something out of nothing and magic in the back line. So it was just so hard to play against them. Best player you've ever played against? I think ob obvious ones are people like Brian Abana, Shane Williams. Um, do you remember, I remember, I remember in that 2015 Lions tour, I played in the final test and um, we had Sidi Sidivatu on, on the wing that started number, number 11 as in sort of my opposite opposite man and he was on fire and probably not a, a name that everyone not a sort of name that goes down in history for the All Blacks but at the time was just scoring tries for fun and you know what probably the, the informed winger um, in the in the world at the time and he started on the wing opposite me and after a, I think about 65 minutes, I saw that the All Blacks were making a few substitutions and his number came up on the on the board to go off. And I was like, thank fuck for that, he's going off. And Joe Rocococo was coming on for the last 20 minutes to replace him. So, you know, that shows how good he was to be, to be keeping someone like smoking Joe on, on the bench. But I think lads, lads like Rocococo, Dougie Howlett, you know, Shane Williams, uh, the obvious one, Brian O'Banna. But there was, a, there was a kid who played for... Um, uh, and I'm forgetting his name now. Um, played for London Irish for years with Saki actually, and he was on the wing. He was Samoan or Tongan or um, I can't remember his name. But oh, uh, you Salossi, Tangi Thakamba. Tangi Thakamba. Tangi Tach, yeah, Tangi Tach, yeah. He, he was a mate. nightmare, wasn't he? Oh, Absolute mate. nightmare. He, he played. He played for Tonga or Samoa or something like that. But it, if he'd have played for the All Blacks, he'd have been a rock of cocoa. But. Mate, he played for fucking London Irish yeah. and he was hard as nails, rapid. He was Joe Rocker Coco. Do you know He's what I mean? Freak. Yeah. Oh, mate, he was, he was Celosia and nobody sort of talks about him, but he was fucking incredible, mate. Mate, unbelievable, wasn't he? I was at Irish yeah. Academy when he was there. Right, was like, yeah. Yeah, super saiyan. Unreal, yeah. mate. Rapid, rapid. Hard and big. <laughs> oh, mate, six, like six foot two or three. Yeah. Rapid, sidestep. Fucking bones made of concrete. Yeah. Oh, mate, he had everything. Yeah, he had everything. Yeah. And Mark, finally, three players in the cab with you for the ultimate piss up. Who are you taking? Andy Powell, Paul, Paul, Paul Saki, and I can't not mention my, my best mate, Dean Schofield. Last one. What's the furthest you've ever thrown a dwarf? <laughs> Probably, probably nine point six meters. I knew you. I knew it was you. I knew it was you. <laughs> he, was, he, he fucking yeah. He was like a, he was like an arrow, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, brilliant well sadly that's all the time we've got left for this no week a huge thank you as always uh, to Ryan and to Max and thanks to Mark for coming on and we will see you all next week cheers cheers, cheers lads Quates, that's awesome. cheers thanks, fellas man. been a Legends. pleasure no worries cheers lads